Jay Blevins was at the game last night covering it for 97.3 ESPN.com. You can read his stuff right now. He's got a great story on Dwight Howard up, and I think Howard is a story that we got to get into too. But what are you seeing, Jay, that is different on the floor about this particular team from the teams that you've covered in the past? I mean, the obvious stuff would be the spacing, but what about the spacing is making this team aesthetically more pleasing? Yeah, you know, I think the league has, as it went to that small ball revolution, it was all about spacing five out, stretch a defense out, and then that would open up uh, driving lanes um, for shots at the rim. I think what the Sixers are doing differently is they're taking that Maury ball concept, but they're they're creating sort of a sun and moon type gravitational opposing forces. You've got the extreme interior gravity uh, of Joel Embiid, who is being, if you watch off ball, he's being doubled off ball right now. So that's when they, they're not even trying to, to uh, feed an entry pass yet. It's before an entry pass, he's already being double teamed. That Immediately someone is open on the, on the perimeter when that happens. And Charlotte did that multiple times, both Saturday night and last night. So that's the one side of the gravity. And then you've got the gravity on the other side of, you know, a Danny Green who just is starting to find out exactly where he needs to stand. And you're seeing his shooting go uh, improve over the last few games. And then a Seth Curry who is just, you know, one of those few guys like a J.J. Redick who um, you have to guard, you know, any anywhere inside of 27 feet. So I think what you're seeing with that is it's creating open lanes for a Ben Simmons to attack all the way downhill uh, for Tobias Harris. It gives Tobias Harris much more time. He's somewhat of a deliberate player, um, much more time to do what he needs to do. And he's thriving in that role. He's Eastern Conference player of the week. Um so I think it's really that what's new about this team is that sort of sun and moon gravity that they're able to to show, and that's just creating real stress on opposing defenses. Right. Now, when I see – if I'm watching and I see Ben Simmons' numbers are similar, um, but isn't it different even though his numbers don't yeah. look like they are so much better? I, I think they are – it's just different for him. It's like the. It's like Steph Cur- Seth Curry is standing out there, whereas before that might be Josh Richardson. So the defender can take two or three steps away from Richardson because he doesn't k- think he's going to catch and shoot it. But he's now got to take that extra step towards Curry because Curry will catch and shoot it, which now creates more room for Simmons. And he has that on both sides of him with Green on one and Curry on the other. So that's where I think it has really help Simmons out almost more than anybody. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, but to to Ben's credit, I would say he won the he won last night's game in the first three minutes. And here's why I say that. What Charlotte did in the second half Saturday night is they trapped, they pressed, they tried to really create chaos uh, in the backward with the Sixers and the Sixers threw the ball all over the place. Uh, they rewarded that trapping and that pressure with 16 turnovers in the second half alone in the beginning of last night's game. And he missed a lot of these shots, but virtually every time down the trip, uh, down the floor for the first three minutes, he went all the way to the rim. Now I think he only made two of those shots, but he went all the way to the rim by himself, no passing. We talk about passing ball movement, and it's great. But what he did was he gave Charlotte no oxygen on the defensive end for creating turnovers early on. He forced them, he, he punished them for even trying to apply pressure. And that forced Charlotte to back up, uh, and it allowed the rest of the team to really settle in and play again. Um, it's things like that that, on the on the sort of intellectual side that Ben Simmons brings that, you know, I, I just, they're hard to quantify, but uh, when you look at the way that you knew Charlotte was going to try to press and trap and they, they tried again later in the game, 
uh, he just he punished them for even thinking about it right off the bat. He set a tone right from the beginning. Now, Gil alluded to this by saying the stat sheet might not really show what Ben Simmons is bringing to the table. I'm a Ben Simmons guy. I know about his passing. I know about his elite defense one through five. But offensively, is this enough production? Now, you can say that there's so many other guys around him that he doesn't need to bring it. But, you know, you're talking 10, 11, 12 points per game, kind of in that range at times. Sometimes it's closer to 15. But is that enough offensive production from Ben Simmons? I think it's a valid question. I think it's the same question that Milwaukee has with with Giannis. Giannis puts up much more numbers, but what he does works fantastically well for wins in the regular season uh, in a more wide open, you know, open court um, play. Then you look at the playoffs where everything becomes much more disciplined, half court defense. I think they both had the same questions around is there can they can they score at enough levels in enough different ways to um to break the will of an opposing defense that's that's elite once you get deep into the playoffs you're going to be playing elite players elite defenders who are who are concentrated and locked in that concern I think is still valid but I think you're going to see a team, and you guys talked about seeding, you're going to see a team that, like Milwaukee last year, is really able to um, just win a ton of regular season games. The way that they're constructed is just, is just I, I think, really suits everyone on that, on that uh, team right now. Uh, Jason Blevins, 97.3 ESPN.com. Make sure uh, you get over there for all the Sixers coverage. We're talking about the starters a lot, um, but one guy that you wrote about, and I and I know that when they signed him, a lot of people might have been like, this guy's a knucklehead, what are you doing? It was almost like when they brought Kwame Brown in a couple of years ago. It's like, really? What, what's this guy's role going to be? I can't say that you've been. people have been more wrong, myself included. Like, this guy has completely reshaped his image, and I'm talking about Dwight Howard. What do you see not only in the minutes he provides, but before and after and during the games on the bench? Yeah, so I agree with you. When, when they first signed him, that was a weird night, if you recall. He tweeted out that he was going back to the Lakers. Two hours later, he had signed with Philadelphia. It was a weird beginning. His introductory press conference, I, I, I went through that transcript and I listened to it again last night. And it, it lasted about 20 minutes. That's unusual. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I started in that press conference half paying attention and thinking, you know, there's limited risk. You're only paying the guy what's close to the veteran minimum. If it doesn't work out, you move on. Uh, over the course of 20 minutes, I really became interested. And I asked a question about 15 minutes in. I finally just raised my hand. I, I had not planned on asking him anything. Uh, I asked him what advice he would give himself uh, to, to a 26 year old version of himself when he was, you know, a superstar, eight time all star, and 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 his answer really surprised me. It showed a depth of maturity, uh, self awareness, uh, humility, and that that those three concepts uh, he's continued to show, and he's shown that. Not just with us, um, but I'm watching him before every game and after every game now. I think it's starting to become a famous thing with the young players, with um, with Ben Simmons. What he'll do during a timeout, I don't, I don't know if this is on TV, but Ben Simmons will be at the scorer's table uh, during a timeout waiting to go back on the floor. And Dwight will not be in the game, but he'll come over, stand next to, to Ben, and just talk to him about the game. You see subtle little ways. Therese Maxey on Saturday night, uh, the two were attached to him before the game, playing one-on-one, defending each other, uh, just sort of being confident, loose, but committed. Um, And then after the game, he's got Isaiah Joe, he's got Dakota Mathias, he's got uh, Matisse Theibel, he's got Terrence Ferguson out there. He's just leading shooting drills. You know, 20 minutes after a game, uh, he's out there. He's got his own 
uh, audio setup that he brings out so that they have music. It's these little ways that that he's contributing, keeping um, you know the, the the commitment to every moment, and that's what he said. Uh, his his first day with uh, with with the team, he said, you know, embrace every moment, um, and he, he's doing that. It's it's surprising because you know I think a lot of people, to your point, were skeptical about his commitment. His uh, his reputation as a young player was as a bit of a goofball, quite frankly, and it didn't work in some places. So, at 35 years old, 17 years in the league, he is uh, very impressive as a as a leader. Yeah, it, it's definitely awesome to see him take on this role. And you mentioned shooting after the games and all. It's it's such a good leadership quality. But you also mentioned. Tyrese Maxey, and I'm looking back at my notes here from yesterday's game, in all caps, the Tyrese Maxey show. I loved what he did in that fourth quarter. What type of skill set does this kid have, and how will that relate to helping out this team? I mean, the, uh, he likes to compare himself to uh, Drew Holiday and to Jamal Murray, but to me, every time he steps on the floor, it screams De'Aaron Fox. And imagine having De'Aaron Fox on your team as your your third point guard. This guy is not turning the ball over. He's he's seeing pressure uh, every night. Uh, people are tr- treating him like a rookie, applying a lot of pressure, trying to make him go on tilt. He's hardly turning the ball over at all. He's taking good shots. He, he had two threes last night. He's got a floater game. He's He's going to be a really good finisher at the rim. I mean, there's a lot to be excited about with Tyrese Maxey. He is such a luxury for this team. Uh, Jason Blevins covers the 76ers at Jay Blevins NBA. Now, I want to get your thoughts because Harris is a guy who's been knocked. A lot of it's because of the contract. We've seen him play well in stretches. Are we to believe that this is a different Tobias Harris? And I'm not talking about Charlotte on Tuesday night in December. I'm talking about in mid-April. Do we get a different Harris, and why would I believe we would? Well, I just, and I said it yesterday to Josh, um, I just think Tobias Harris is in that tier of player where he's not a superstar on his own to carry a team. But when when he's in the right situation with the right fit, and we're going back to the spacing conversation, he can he can absolutely punish other teams when he, they are building a game plan to stop three other guys on the team. He's absolutely capable of punishing a team for doing that. And if you're, if you're an opposing team right now and you're building a defensive game plan against the Sixers, he's got to be number four, right? Because you, you got to stop Joel Embiid number one. You have to do that. Number two, you have to make sure that uh, Ben Simmons doesn't have you know, free reign to, to operate. Number three, I think, is Seth Curry. You cannot leave him open. And when, you, when you're building a defensive game plan to stop all three of those, you just you only have so many um, tools in the toolbox, most teams. That's going to uh, that's gonna open up so much for a very competent, um, near all-star level player in Tobias Harris where he can just punish people. And I think he's doing that. A lot has been made of Joel Embiid's hockey assists. How impressed are you with his passing out of the double team to to swing it out to a guy in the corner and then bang, 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 it is just moving around the perimeter and they're getting such great looks off of it. Yeah, it's, it is a real improvement. So what you'll see is he, he picks the ball up and he's able to pump fake, get a defense to bite, to close off the pass the the uh, the open man and he's hitting the second guy and that's when and Brett Brown used to use this word we don't want to get in scramble mode but that's what he's doing to the other team he's putting the other team in scramble mode and then from then on it makes it very easy for the other guys to to swing the ball around and they're creating fantastic looks if you look at the shot uh, shot chart from last night it was you know seventy percent shots at the rim and you know, 25%, 28% of uh, three-pointers. And a big part of that uh, starts with him and his ability to to punish teams for those doubles. 
Jay, I'm going to ask you a question that I don't want to say is controversial, but would probably spark a split here in the audience, which would be you're there every night for the most part, uh, as much as they let us uh, with the certain situations going on. You've been there the last couple of years covering this team, so you know Brett's style. You've now seen this. How much of what we're seeing is new coaching philosophy and credit to the new coaching staff, and how much of what we're seeing is they got a better roster, a better roster fit, a better roster construction? Yeah, I think it's it's like uh, let's break it down. I think it's fifty uh, percent coaching, just new voices, and I think you know we don't have to slam the the old coaching staff, but it, they're new voices, new terminology. They're not as easy to tune out when they're saying the same thing over and over again. We saw this with Andy Reid. I I think you know Andy Reid's a great coach, but at a certain point after fourteen years. You know, everyone has heard what he's got to say. Um, so I think it's 50% that. I think it's it's 30% just putting complimentary pieces on on the roster uh, by Daryl Borey, to his credit. Uh, and then there's 20% of it is just, yeah, two young superstars who are a year, year older have gotten smacked around in the playoffs enough times to um, – to feel the sting and the burn and are learning from their mistakes. They are maturing. They're improving in the spots that they were weak. Um, And you're just now seeing two young superstars, uh, you know, figure it out. All right. Uh, Obviously. and, And by the way, I think another thing that is a little underrated is one thing, if you really want to criticize, I don't know how critical it is of Brett was, I don't think he had the most experienced uh, staff. And right. you have a staff now that has a lot of not only experience, but a resume. They played in the league. And I think that is very helpful as well. Totally agree. I, I, uh, you know, we're, you're, you're there. So we, we see a lot of people. We see legends, Hall of Famers, you know, all the time. The one time I sort of, um, had a whoa, that's really cool moment was seeing Sam Cassell as an assistant last year. To have a Sam Cassell out there who's very active with these players, communicates really well with them. That is, it's hard to put a price on that. Dave Yorger is another one who's been a head coach in the league. I don't have a feel yet for exactly what his role is, aside from we know that he's in charge of the defense and the defense is the best in the NBA, but I don't, I don't get the the feel from from watching him interact yet. But Sam Cassell, like that, is such a great assistant to have on your team. And Brett's Brett's, uh, you know, talent development uh, philosophy uh, was very oriented towards younger, inexperienced uh, assistants. Yeah, I think that's a big uh, change as well. All right, Jay Blevins. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Jay Blevins NBA. Check out his piece right now on Dwight Howard and get the rest of his Sixers coverage on our website, 973ESPN.com. Inside the Sixers here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. All right. He uh, will be back. And, of course, tomorrow uh, we will go inside the Sixers with uh, Paul Hudrick. We will uh, go around the Sixers just like we do football at four. We're going to do a little Sixers, a little NBA with our trio of Sixers insiders Hudrick tomorrow, McCormick Hudrick on Friday, Blevins on Tuesday